All right, it is, what is it, November 8th, a Monday. Welcome to episode number 617 of Let There Be Talk. Thank you for joining me. I'm fresh back from San Jose and Reno doing shows with Bill Burr. That was fantastic. I cannot thank you guys enough. Everybody that came out to uh, see a little comedy and laugh. I've got some upcoming new shows that have just been announced November 26, 27, 28. I will be at the Legendary Comedy Works in Denver, Colorado. Tickets are available now at the Comedy Works website or go to deandelray.com. Also, this week, it's time, Oregon. I'm coming to Bend, Oregon, November 11th and Portland, November 12th. Please get tickets. I'm headlining, and I want to see all of you up there in the Pacific Northwest. Do a road trip wherever you're at. Come see me and Shailen McDonough, my uh, fantastic friend and feature. And then back to Vegas, November 15th through the 21st. So busy November. Thank God I am working. Oh, the new material's feeling pretty strong. I love it. And uh, I love seeing you guys' faces again. So get tickets, deandelray.com right away. And get some, uh, get some merch. Do not miss out on the new merch. Makes great Christmas gifts for the friends. And patreon.com slash deandelray, where you get all the bonus episodes and you can join me once a week on a live Zoom. Patreon.com slash deandelray. Thank you, Snakemouth69, Thea Shook, Steve Hodgson, Andrew Burt, and the king of the Dell Razors, Mark Brunot. Thank you all for supporting me on Patreon. Who's the guest today? I'll tell you right now. It's Tom Vitale. Tom Vitale was a longtime director and producer for Anthony Bourdain, and he has wrote an incredible book called In the Weeds, and it takes you behind the scenes on some of the most uh, insane stories that were going on while they were filming Parts Unknown and No Reservations. And he's worked with Anthony for years. It's unreal, this guy's book and his stories. And I cannot recommend it enough. I mean, Bourdain was, you know, he's just a magic human. And everybody's still shocked by the loss and very much missed. I mean, I just love this guy's amazing, amazing uh, you know, shows that he did. Very inspirational. And Tom was behind the scenes directing and producing these. And he, Tom is a great, great human, man. It was so cool to talk to him. We dive way into what it was like to film these shows. These shows were very complicated to film. If you've uh, ever watched Parts Unknown or, or No Reservations, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes before Tony even gets there. You know, setting up the shoots, getting the okay, the visas, getting the equipment there, finding the food, finding these people that are called the fixers that set up political stuff that, uh, you know, that it's just, it's absurd what goes down. And to uh, read this book in the weeds it really gives you the uh, behind the curtain look at it. Thank you, Tom, for doing the show. What a great, great guest. And uh, I think you guys are going to love his book. What else we got going? A um, couple more things. The episode is brought to you by Standard and Strange, my one stop shop where I get denim, leather, boots, everything. You've seen me wear some pretty cool uh, jackets. Well, now you can get one for free. Because Standard and Strange and myself are giving away a free leather about every five to six weeks. All you got to do is go to standardandstrange.com slash Delray and leave your email and then we'll put you in the drawing. We're not selling your info or anything. Just leave your email and we uh, do a drawing for a free leather jacket, a Y2 leather. Come on. This is super cool. Also... My optical sponsor, you know, I love me some glasses. I go to one shop only, and that is Optical Connections. And I'll tell you how to find them right now. Go to their website, tell them I sent you, you'll get a discount. Optical 
connection.com. Optical dash connection.com. Hit them up and uh, tell Armin I sent you. They have the best selection of glasses. Oh my God. People are always asking me, where do you get your glasses? This is where I get them. They ship anywhere in the world. So don't worry. Follow them on Instagram. Also optical connection on Instagram. They are in studio city, Los Angeles. Call them up and tell them I sent you get the discount. Love these guys. Okay. Hope to see you at the shows. A lot of stand-up shows, and I'm fired up to go back to Comedy Works. I cannot tell you how much I love that club. So Denver, get your tickets. Bend, Oregon, get your tickets. Portland, Oregon, get your tickets. Las Vegas, get them. Get it out there. Here he is right now. Tom Vitale, candles are lit. <laughs> Where do you live? New York? Yeah, the Hudson Valley. Oh, all right. Oh, Hudson Valley. Yep. Wow, nice. Sleepy up there, right? It's beautiful right now. Uh, leaves are just changing. Got a beautiful view out of the river, uh, of the river, just um, out the window. What is that, like a Victorian you're in? It is, in fact, yeah. <laughs> hey, you like architecture. I, we're, I love architecture, dude. It's my life. Yeah, I'm... Uh, a big fan of, um, you know, 1850s to 1890s kind of architecture. So, yeah, I've got my own rambling uh, fixer-upper, Victorian fixer-upper in the Hudson Valley. That's cool. I, I mean, I, it's funny because over the years I've gone through different addictions uh, growing up in San Francisco, uh, you know, those Victorians and those those amazing houses around hate street, you know, whole yeah. band would live in, you know, and then I became obsessed with really, really cool Spanish homes in like the Hollywood Hills. Oh yeah. And then of course, always worshiped like mid century stuff. But now that's really my, my life is just mid century. It's all pretty great. Uh, see, I didn't used to like mid century too much. It seems like, uh, but as soon as something hits 50 years for me, it starts to become pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it is true. It's funny. Uh, you go out to Palm Springs a little bit and you're, then you're in, you're like, Oh, okay. I'm a, I'm an old man. <laughs> 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 give, me, give me the mid century small dog and, uh, you know, some mountain views and I'm, I'm good. Yeah. It's beautiful out there. How are you, man? Good. Thanks. I'm uh, really honored. You uh, wanted to speak with me. Oh, Thank man. You. Yeah. I mean, you were you were part of a uh, incredible piece of history of TV that uh, there's not a lot of good TV in the uh, especially in the last maybe 25 years. I think once reality TV hits, it becomes kind of a shit show. And this was a, a beautiful uh, work of art amongst the Guy Fieri's out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, it was kind of its own genre, wasn't it, um, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Auth authenticity, you know, something real. Uh, I mean, you can name the great shows on your hands, you know, going all the way back to like All in the Family. As far as real stuff, Hill Street Blues, uh, you know, get into Sopranos, The Wire, Breaking Bad. And then Tony's show. These are shows that I, I've watched and I don't watch TV at all. I mean, it's amazing to hear uh, that our shows are in such um, impressive company. Well, I think that um, the crew and Tony had an incredible influence, uh, the influences that they they gathered off of, whether it be a Apocalypse Now or, you know, mm -hmm. any kind of great classic cinematography and great films and and add your own thing to it you're going to have something really beautiful you know yeah well i mean you know tony was such a he was an amateur historian and such a you know fan of um certain films and uh music that sort of thing and so it was kind of his dream to uh basically sort of live all those experiences i mean that's how it started at least just think about if he never wrote kitchen confidential we wouldn't have had tony you know what I mean? Because that's yeah. the game changer. That's when I find out about him. There he is on David Letterman promoting the book. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? I'm up late 
waiting for a band probably that's going to play on there. And then I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's great. I'm not a big book reader. I read like maybe two a year. Now I read a shitload for this show, but I grabbed the book and there I am. I'm I'm hooked on Tony for life. It's, it's an amazing book, isn't it? It is amazing book, you know, it's and, and but him. It's really crazy, especially when you get into the VO of uh, Tony that writing it's wild how yeah. articulate and smart he is this guy was like i mean just to think he's a chef at one time with this insane brain back there i don't know how he didn't go like i'm fucking out of here i'm destined for something else you know <laughs> well i think he'd been trying to make it as a writer for quite a while before kitchen confidential you know with his uh, earlier uh, fiction work i think uh it was a surprise to him that the nonfiction ended up being so popular but um, that Kitchen Confidential that you, you uh, sorry, the Tony recognizing Kitchen Confidential, he was very much like that. Uh, you know, when, when I think of him, that kind of, it just, that lines up a lot. So as you can imagine, he was quite, quite a person to spend uh, time with, especially in um, crazy, amazing, wonderful, sometimes scary locations all around the world. There couldn't have been a better travel uh, companion. His voiceover was so amazing the way he could talk about something that was really complex and not revert to a platitude um, and, you know, say something so poignant and, and beautiful. It was a, uh, it was a gift and he was able to do that so quickly in his writing and often even speak that way. He had a real gift. Well, I think also um, me being a, a talker all my life, you know, either a singer in a band or, or now a comedian and a podcaster it's really interesting. You'll get a lot of comments on people like, ah, I don't like this guy's voice. What did he do? Swallow razor blades? Or some people go, I love his voice. Oh, I love it. Tony had this, and it's something that I pick up because I edit my own podcast. He had this cadence and this rhythm and this comfort to his voice. It was really wild. It would just grab you. And if you just listen to it with your eyes closed, you're, you're there wherever he's talking mm -hmm. about. And that is, that is a gift, you know, for people to, I mean, I think that's 50% of uh, who Tony was to be able to bring you in with this, uh, this comforting voice. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, the voiceover, he had a lot of practice to kind of get that right. Uh, I mean, we did multiple VO sessions for each episode, so he was constantly in the VO, but he was such a professional um, at that. He made it look so effortless, and voiceover is really hard. It is. Um, which most people don't really realize. Yeah, he was uh, He was so good at it. Um, and his, his eye, you know, his ability to see a detail and to kind of focus uh, a narrative around that detail, for instance, was just such a, I mean, he was just such a great, what's the word, like, a, you know, lens with which to, uh, through which to see things. Well, the, the, the VO is crazy hard because I shot a show, Josh worked on it, and you go in to do the VO and you think you're just going to go in and, you know, okay, you know, this man makes incredible t-shirts. When I first saw it, I couldn't believe my mind. And then you kind of run out and you're like, oh, you can't just wing this. You need to kind of sit down and figure out an arc that's going to grab people in, you know? Well, I, I recorded the audio book of, um, of my book. And yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was challenging. <laughs> yeah. Especially when the, when they're there and they go, uh, that's no, you, you did this part wrong. You get, you, and you're like, every word has to be the same as the book <laughs> where when you're winging it, you kind of forget what you were talking about. And then you just kind of start to create something, but you could tell he never, he was never winging it, man. Uh, I mean, well, he actually, he would ad lib in the voiceover booth often actually. Wow. Um, usually off of something that was written. He, we would send him the narration scripts and he would rewrite them. So somebody would write it at the top first, the editor or I, or even the director, there were a couple other directors on the show. The editors and the directors would write the scratch narration to the cut. And then, you know, after a certain number of weeks in the edit, we would send that cut to Tony with a voiceover script, which he would then rewrite to varying degrees. Sometimes he wouldn't have had a chance to do his homework and get into the VO booth. And of course, like he was, he was very, very tough on the writing, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, yeah. He'd say things like, what bong smoky monkey wrote this or. Uh... <laughs> so he would, he would actually 
ad lib and, and change them. I mean, I would be very hard pressed actually to think of a single VO session that he, and I'm talking about hundreds, if not thousands of voiceover sessions where he didn't actually change something, even if it was a small tweak. So, I mean, it was always pretty terrifying because he was probably about to get an airplane and go somewhere and the show was going to lock and he's changing words and stuff in the script and like, oh my gosh, is this going to fit together the right way or accidentally be repetitious or, you know, reverse the uh, order in which we're kind of introducing things. And so it could be pretty terrifying. I gotta, I gotta say, uh, I've been reading your book, man. It's uh, let's tell everybody what's called. It's called in the weeds. Now, when did this come out? October 5th, October pretty recently. Yeah. Really, really good book. And uh, Thank you. yeah, I've been digging through it. Also, I just <clears throat> was watching uh, Under the Tarp. Oh, yeah. Which is which is great to see a lot of the uh, inside stuff. Did you see Morgan's documentary? I'm sure you did. Yeah, um, uh, he interviewed me for the uh, for Roadrunner. So that was, um, yeah, uh, I mean, all very surreal that we're making a documentary about Tony that didn't really involve Tony. I mean, it involved him, but the interview was done at a, uh, a closed restaurant. Um, and I was so used to seeing restaurants so full and chaotic and busy with life. So to go to, to go to a restaurant that was so quiet with the cameras again, and, you know, to know we were there to talk about Tony cause he was gone was, um, yeah, it was, it was a little emotional. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. One of my closest friends, Brody Stevens, fantastic comedian, committed suicide. And Sorry. it's it's almost uh, impossible for me to uh, listen to the podcast that I've done with him over the years yeah. or watch clips because it, uh, it comes out of nowhere. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people will ask you, like, did you see any signs? With, what was the deal? And this is how your book opens up, you know? And you know, everybody has that darkness, but you just figure we're just all going to keep going. You know, of course, I, I mean, I get mad depression and stuff, but uh, then something happens and you keep going. So it, it's really, really hard. And I can imagine for you guys even to go back and make like under the tarp or something. You're just looking at all this footage and like what happened, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I don't know if it's the kind of thing you ever get over. Um, no. You just sort of learn to live with it. Um, you know, it was so unbelievable. It's still unbelievable that Tony killed himself. Um, in that immediate aftermath, we had to make a couple episodes, including under the tarp to fulfill the contracts. There were you know, episodes that uh, were still owed to the network for that season. So the machine kind of kept going. This is a machine again, that started in 2005 when, you know, um, we got the green light for no reservations or even actually before that with the pilots and it hadn't stopped moving since that point. Um, so it, it kept going and we made those two episodes and it was actually cathartic to talk to, um, I chose to do the crew special cause I knew I'd get a chance to, you know, talk to other members of the team. And so that was, um, that was helpful it, when that was over, we finished in October, I think because I was still also editing another episode in Indonesia we'd shot shortly before Tony died without his voiceover. When all that was over, that's when it kind of really started to sink in and get harder, at least, yeah, get, uh, making, long story short, making Under the Tarp was, um, again, it was weird, but it was really actually good to do that, to not stop instantly on June, you know, 9th. Your story is uh, amazing. Like you get this gig as, as the editor assistant, which is just a kind of a shit job of like taking notes. Uh, entry level position. Yeah. yeah. Getting sandwiches and stuff all the way to the top gun for uh, parts unknown, which is just, just in a great, great story. 16 years. Yeah. Yeah. That that's gotta be uh, an, an, a, like just this crazy adrenaline ride that when you step off that, it's kind of like, now what? I mean, what, what, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, if I had stepped off it, it would be like that, but none of us stepped off of it. It was, um, it just instantly ended and, in, you know, kind of such an awful way. And I mean, my entire adult life, my career identity was also wrapped up in the show. It wasn't even just that, you know, there'd been a horrible tragedy and we'd lost 
you know, a good friend and someone who was so special. It was everything along with that. I mean, for so many of us who worked on the show, Tony was, you know, a, a role model. You know, all of a sudden you know, to start questioning the wisdom of all the the, the path that, you know, we were on. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm still kind of dealing with that a bit, but writing the book actually was really helpful because it kind of, so I didn't go back to work in TV after I finished with Under the Tarp. Um, I thought I would, but then it just didn't feel right. And that dragged on and on and on, drinking a lot, et cetera. Um, finally, after I sort of hit rock bottom two years after Tony died and I needed to do something, um, I decided to write the book, and which I've just finished quite recently. And throughout all those two years, I mean, I wasn't watching the shows or looking at anything, but obviously every day you're thinking about that kind of stuff. And then writing the book, it almost felt like I was working on the show again and that Tony was alive again. And we were all back there. And I got to process a lot of what had happened um, or how I was feeling, not just in the aftermath of Tony's death, but also over 12 years of traveling with him because so many things had happened, both amazing and, you know, not so amazing at times. But it was just so nonstop, go, go, go for all those years that I hadn't had a chance to even wrap my head around it. I, I discovered during that period, I wrote a check and I put 2006 on the date on the check. And it like just, you know, when you don't sort of don't think that used to happen to me when the year would change and I'd write last year, right. you know, in January, I wrote 2006, which is when I started traveling with um, Tony and I still use checks, which is another sign that I'm trapped in the mid aughts. <laughs> I do too. I'm old school, man. You know, you just, Hey, where do I write a che check for this rent? And they're like, uh, you just, digitally move it over i'm like I, right. uh, what <laughs> you know i mean i'm, I'm a <laughs> computer savvy but i'm also like i like a piece of a trail i like paper trail yeah me too. <laughs> it's hilarious i wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the stuff in here this book is great man uh it's called in the weeds you guys got to get this book right away uh it's funny to think about i travel a lot too for a living and it is you ever think about this when you get on a plane and you fly somewhere and then you fly back home? It's almost like you weren't even there. It's the weirdest mm -hmm. time travel. I don't even yeah. know where places are in the United States when I'm gone. Like they're going, I get off the plane. I don't know where the fuck I am unless I saw <laughs> a, a map of the United States, you know? Well, the, yeah. I mean, you're touching on this weird thing about traveling a lot and especially traveling for work too which is that it kind of becomes this sort of blur in a certain way. I mean, we always knew very well where we were because that was kind of up to me and the producer to plan that and know what the story was. So that was a bit more present in our minds, but it would just kind of feel, I mean, it would often be on the flight home. I would look at the pictures on my phone that I had taken and then I would be like, wow, that was actually probably a cool trip or that's going to make a great show. It's almost like, yeah, there's this unreality to the whole thing. I mean, I, you know, for 12 years went on 80 trips with him. Um, so yeah, it was this, this crazy roller coaster ride. I love, I love when you watch, when you watch this under the tarp or, or you watch the Morgan Neville docker or, or any kind of behind the scenes, half the time you're watching it going like, how did these guys not quit? Like, fuck you, you know, but then you understand <laughs> that he is kind of like that. Uh, he's that big bear, you know, that grizzly bear. I'm just like, ah, but then you, you want to hug him, you know? Well, I mean, over the years, one person left the road crew willingly. One, one person. And it was for a very big promotion to something else. People right. did not leave that job. Uh, willingly. And um, that's not just me. I mean, t Tony was unbelievably magnetic. I mean, I think that's part of the magic, his magic recipe was his sort of magnetism. And it came through very well in the television. It was a hundred times stronger in person, wow. especially, you know, in person and like kind of close proximity person where, I mean, we all knew each other. Most of the people who worked on the road crew had been doing it for at least a decade. So we were all um, 
very, very close, very small group of people. Yeah, it was, uh, you didn't, you didn't walk away from a job like that. Sally, one of the other directors once joked, someone has to die. And, uh, <laughs> when he said, Oh, great. Sally, it was in publicly. She'd said that in an interview or something. <laughs> great. Sally. Now you've all got it like a target on your back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. People yeah. would kill for that job. And I'm sure they, they would have, uh, it was the most amazing job that you could imagine something different all the time, getting to have those experiences. I and mean, we did the math once on roughly what it would cost to the camera guys night at the end of a long shooting day to kind of boost morale. What would it cost to have, uh, you know, how many episodes have you done, Zach? How many have you done, Todd? And, you know, for each of us, it would have been several million dollars to have the kind of experiences we'd had. And this was oh God, eight, nine years before even the end. So you can only imagine. I, it's not even once in a lifetime. It's once in many lifetimes kind of adventure and amazing experience. Do you feel that the uh, parts unknown, I mean, cause as I'm reading your book, you know, Tony was like so excited to get the hell away from, you know, no reservations in that mm -hmm. network. Do you feel once he got to CNN and parts unknown that he was finally making the show that he always wanted to make, because you got the first era of Tony where it's kind of uh You've got the setup stuff of like, whoa, you know, kind of reality TV vibe. Then you get into no reservations. It starts to get cooler. And then by the time you get to parts unknown, it's like, wow, this is some serious art here. Do you feel that that was the ultimate show that he wanted to make? As close to it as I guess any of us will ever see. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, everything was always a fight for Tony. He, he had to fight you know, convention, show some ups, teases, all these things. And, you know, I mean, he was on TV for so long that he had time to actually succeed with a lot of these things. Um, by the time we got to parts unknown, that was definitely a kind of a line of demarcation, the production values, you know, the, the cinematography, the editing all classed up um, around that time. You know, you'll see in later, a couple of later, no reservations that, you could almost change the title on and it could be a parts unknown. It was, it was sort of a natural evolution. One of the big differences with parts unknown was that now all of a sudden we could go to this whole list of places. Tony had always wanted to go that just were not appropriate for travel channel for travel channel. You know, we got to Beirut, um, Haiti after the quake and trip to Kurdistan and Iraq. Those were Tony's kind of three victories with them, but all three of those were big fights. They didn't want, to go or to broadcast a show about going to a place where the average sort of tourist would probably last about three seconds. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, so again, by the time we went to parts unknown, especially the first season, it was just, I mean, went to Myanmar, Burma, Libya, and Congo all in a couple months and some other places as well. But basically Tony sort of, I've wanted to go here forever sort of list. So there, I mean, there was such a kind of, excitement and enthusiasm from him ultimately um that season and at the beginning of parts unknown i think that the episodes and the show kept evolving you know so i don't think it really was where it was going to end up because it was always changing even in parts unknown you know constantly just as we always had pushing the envelope how long can we go without voiceover uh can we just have all of act six with no talking not even any you know sound ups just visuals you know uh what can we get away with with uh s &P? I mean, yeah. so he was always pushing and I mean, there were, <laughs> it was so funny over the years, it was negotiated how many shits per episode Tony was allowed to say and how many goddams. And, you know, there are these, there were these meetings and all these people in suits and lawyers and standards and practices having this very serious, very expensive conversations over what Tony, you know, what profanity Tony could and couldn't say on TV. Um, and he just loved that kind of thing to think about making a bunch of suits, having to read from transcriptions of some of the awful stuff he was saying that we were trying to get on the air. One of his techniques was to go 50% further than you wanted to end up because then, you know, I guess you're starting from a stronger uh, bargaining position. Right. So right. Oftentimes a lot of the rough cuts would purposefully be, you know, so completely unairable back on travel and parts unknown also. And uh, yeah, there were some pretty fun. So then when they want to, when they are negotiating, you already know that that stuff's not going to make it, but they've cut that out. And then you've got your show that you want. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so 
figuring out that balance was a bit of an art and something that we, uh, you know, sort of worked on, I guess, through a process of trial and error. I mean, again, I just think back about the number of episodes and there was an unusually large amount of time, I think, compared to other shows to sort of experiment. I mean, Tony was at the center of it always, um, which is, you know, what creates that continuity between the series and the seasons. But uh, it definitely was getting closer to what, you know, his original dream was. Yeah. When the show started to really look cinematic and be less like a somewhat hokey homage to a film, you know, he was so, that was a big, another big moment at some point in the reservations. How were you guys getting that look? Like, of course, I, uh, I saw, you know, the camera technology gets better and better, but over the years, I mean, you guys are shooting digital, but a lot of it looked like beautiful film. Yeah. I mean, this stuff, some of it was just incredible because, you know, when you see TV now, say these shows that are on the food channel or, or travel channel, they look horrendous, you know, and then your show would come on. It was like a piece of art. I mean, the teams that made the shows were unbelievable. Uh, you know, our cinematographers, directors of photography were just brilliant. I mean, the ability to, because the thing is that the, the shows were not well planned, or at least that's not the right way to say it. Things changed all the time. There was, you know, they had to be incredibly uh, flexible, mobile, and quick to capture good stuff. You know, if there's some amazing thing we're seeing out the window, stop the van, let's go film it. It's really hard to set too many things up in advance when, you know, it's new and different all the time. And whatever you're sort of end up chasing is better than what uh, you could have planned. So really unique skill set to be able to photograph with such a high quality and caliber um, on the run. So on the run, exactly. Yeah. You know, the scenes we'd film with Tony, they took more time to set up because we put up some lights almost always and, you know, spend more time setting up for that. But the B-roll was very kind of go out and spend a couple hours with the camera and a tripod and, you know, our local contact to translate and the AC and, you know, see what we come back with. So they, yeah, are amazing. I mean, <laughs> We all, again, worked together for so long, so we knew sort of what to do. Um, you just kind of could sense certain rhythms when it came to uh, conversations or not missing things from Tony. Tony wouldn't do second takes, so we had to get everything on the first uh, you know, time. <laughs> yeah, I love that um, South Pole scene where yeah. he's like, oh, the asshole of the earth. And then, like, can we get a second take? And he's like, are you fucking kidding? No. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna, I mean, that's what I loved about him. Like, he's not going to react anything, you know, re, like redo a, 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 a natural moment. And he'd go the opposite. Yeah. In fact, um, we're lucky he was so funny when he was saying, fuck you, because we got to use a lot of that in the shows throughout the years. Right. For various reasons. Um, less so as time went on, because he wanted the show to be a little bit less snarky. I mean, the show's sort of changed over time. Tony remained, you know, very consistent throughout that time. I didn't, you know, I didn't watch the shows because I made them and didn't really have time to watch any other TV anyway. So having sort of like lived them, I guess I don't really have that context of other shows and how they were received. I mean, I know after he died, I was extremely surprised as were a lot of people who worked on the show just at how many people I guess were watching and um, what an impact Tony had had. Oh God. Yeah. I lived up the street uh, 21st and third and the day he died, I walked to the comedy cellar every day. I go by his old restaurant and there was like, you know, 10 flowers and some mm -hmm. notes. And then the next day there was a hundred flowers and notes by the third day, there was thousands of flower reefs and notes and letters and photos. It was it was unreal. And these pe people are coming from around the world. <laughs> we're like hardened, you know, line cooks. Yeah. Like people that, you know, don't look like they should cry. And they were there crying on the street. People driving from all across the country to leave notes taped to that window. That was, that was incredible. You know, I wanted to ask you, you, you guys kind of skirted on the under the tarp, but what was a typical budget for? an episode because it looks like a million bucks, how great it looks, you know? I don't actually know the answer to that question, um, <laughs> including everyone's sort of salaries and all that kind well, of yeah, thing. I right. mean, you know, it, it's somewhere in the like probably half a million to $700,000 uh, when you include 
you know, the edits and everything. It was, it was um, not a cheap show to make. Yeah. It was an expensive show, even from the beginning on a cook's tour, just because of the travel and moving. I mean, you know, it was not at all uncommon to arrive at the airport, you know, check in our 32 cases and pay somewhere between five to $10,000 excess luggage fees for one leg of a flight. God. So, I mean, it was, uh, it was not cheap. Man, that is wild. Holy smokes. It, 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 I love, I love reading this. Uh, I was reading the Burma, uh, chapter mm -hmm. and, uh, this is typical Tony. I love it where you guys get this lady. She refuses to do the show. She went to prison and everything. And then she says she'll do the show. She's ordering like a million plates. You guys are like, nah, you know, we only need like three or four. She still does it. Then Tony yeah. Googles her and finds out she sold out her people. And so he does the whole thing. And, and you, you guys are like, well, that went pretty good. He goes, yeah, we'll destroy her in the VO. <laughs> I, was like, what? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, I, I guess we sort of did in a way in that he, he didn't talk about politics on camera with her, which is what she'd asked, but he did mention without being too judgmental, um, in the voiceover that, you know, in certain camps, she was unpopular for her decisions. So even that, uh, amazing Tony way, I, I think that will destroy her in voiceover was more to frighten me personally for the mistake I'd made of allowing this cock up to happen. <laughs> Oh my God. There was an interesting thing that uh, when I interviewed Morgan, I felt where I watched the documentary that, you know, me being an ex drug guy and stuff, I, I felt like, was he constantly chasing a new high? Was he running from something? But in under the tarp, there was a quote under there on there that really hit me. And it woke me up was, he wasn't running from something. He was running towards something. And I was like, wow, that, that is right. Like, I, I feel like I'm like that too, where I'm constantly trying to learn and find new stuff and do different stuff. And you think you're running from something like, yeah, I don't want to idle. But I think now when I heard that quote, I was like, oh yeah, I don't want to idle because we're only here a little bit of time. And if I don't try to get everything in, I can. What a waste of time. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, Tony was voraciously consumed everything. He was always he was always in a, in a hurry, in a rush. Yeah. Nick said that line about um, Tony was like a shark. He, uh, you know, he wanted to keep moving. He was running towards something. Um, it was a nice way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you sit down to write the book, is this your first book? Yeah, I've only ever, um, I guess, written like uh, college papers, a few love notes and the scratch voiceovers for the show. How do you sit down and start the book? I, I mean, of course, you start with the first chapter of, you know, Tony dying and you going to JFK to meet the crew and everything. But once you go there, I mean, I, I, I know you were watching a lot of stuff and reliving and everything, but how do you frame the the idea of this is what the book's going to be? You know what I mean? Because it's got to be like you got a million stories. Yeah. Well, there are a million stories. And um, unfortunately, uh, not enough uh, pages to, to fit them all in, obviously. Uh, when I when I started writing the book, I it took me a long time to actually start writing. I um, kept distracting myself and chasing butterflies with the kind of, you know, research and vast amount of, you know, materials that um, I had more so than the average uh, person probably who sits down to write a memoir because we made a TV show, which means that everything was documented. Not everything, but much of it was. So, yeah, eventually I realized that I was not going to have time to write the book if I kept researching all this stuff. So I just started writing. I think I, and I couldn't write. I saw writer's block. And so I, I stayed up. Like, I'm not going to sleep until I get something down on paper or in the computer. And after 24 hours of being awake, something kind of magical happened. And I just sort of started writing, then discovered that I had to sort of be awake for days in order to write. And I'd go on these crazy writing binges and then sleep for a couple of days. And that lasted through a lot of the pandemic, or I guess, yeah, not even over yet, the pandemic. Um, 
but it just kind of wrote itself. Uh, there's, a, I guess, more of an emphasis on Parts Unknown episodes. I think I did about 39 of them. Right. I mean, there's probably 10 or 15 places I sort of focus on more trips and then lots of other little anecdotes from some other episodes and adventures. But yeah, I mean, there was clearly not, uh, there, there could be 10 sequels, not that I will, not, I'll never write one, but easily enough material for 10 more of them. I mean, with Tony, like even, even the most basic, normally boring things were just fascinating when Tony was around because of the, you know, the pressure and his creativity and, you know, the amazing places we were. It's just, he could elevate the mundane to the surreal and magical. I mean, every time he opened his mouth. I love, I love the part where you're like, I, I didn't like a lot of the food, but I just didn't tell Tony. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm the same way, man. I didn't eat Brussels sprouts till a couple of years ago. And that's just Brussels sprouts because <laughs> I couldn't stand the look or the name, you know, or cauliflower. I'm like, but I, I mean, some of that stuff, man, they're eating is just unreal. It's, oh. Well, I, I have a, a fish phobia. Yeah. Which um, I did not want Tony to know about because he would have uh, exploited that. Eventually he did find out um, and that was mostly pretty much surprisingly okay with it and never really weaponized it against me. Um, <laughs> fortunately, that was in later years, but <laughs> he would eat almost anything if it was something that was popular and good, you know, wherever we were. It was something that local locals were eating, you know, in some earlier few earlier episodes of no reservations and in a cook's tour he's convinced to eat some things just for the shock value like right eating cobra's heart and he never really lived that down people i mean it was one of the most common questions that he would get when i'd see people interact with him we had met before like what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten and he um you know, he really regretted doing that uh that beating cobra heart because that really wasn't the message of the show like for him the whole point was this food is not strange and terrible it's actually really good it's just different than what you're used to. I, uh, you know, I, I would lose 10 to 15 pounds each episode because I wouldn't eat, but that was not just because of any food phobias I had. Uh, there was just too much sort of stress and pressure to get it right, to have anything that approached an appetite. Um, so I, you know, now in retrospect, I'm like, God damn it. I really should have, you know, enjoyed a few more of those those things because i mean he did eat some weird things but i mean my god we also filmed at the best restaurants in the world or you know we go to italy or spain or other places too i mean even for a, a squeamish eater i mean the foods that we were surrounded by the quality of the meats and cheeses and wines and alcohol i mean it was i say thank god i'm not a huge foodie or adventurous eater i probably would have you know i'd be morbidly obese after that trip uh those trips <laughs> <laughs> there was right. a lot of food and every food single like bit of food that made it on the screen you know there had to be somewhere between three to seven versions of that that we would film in different steps oh yeah i couldn't believe i read that like because you didn't want the restaurant to run out of it so you order seven each one so a backup meal one that tony would eat then one that you guys would eat and one you would mm -hmm. shoot that's that's like that's crazy too. All the food being uh, bought, you know. Well, we'd have to film at the table first because we didn't know what Tony was going to order, even if it was a place that was famous for just one thing, like a hamburger. He'd somehow always change the game at the last minute. So we would have food, you know, on the table. He'd eat first. Then we'd have to go back to the kitchen after he left to film it being made. Then again, out at the table this time with, um, you know, insert shots because we had to be on Tony for the majority of the time before, because Tony didn't do retakes. So you couldn't afford to miss a shot of, um, Tony saying something while photographing the food. And so basically two thirds of the shots we need for the food aren't going to exist. If Tony ate the last, you know, the last, uh, the last hamburger that day, or if during the busy lunch rush when we were filming, the hamburgers all sold out. So yeah, I had to pre-order seven of whatever he ate but also whatever he might eat too so wow <laughs> yeah there was a lot of um the food never went to waste it did get eaten but we um we bought a lot of food over the years and uh there were a couple times where sort of triggered food riots in, in various places so it could, it could backfire as well there was never really a um, perfect solution to any of these problems but i mean the fact that it was also sort of chaotic and uncontrollable 
I think is another big part of the magic recipe. I mean, I shot a pilot and Josh worked on it. And the whole time he was working on it, I kept thinking like, you know, this guy worked with Tony. You're a magical giant, Josh. Yeah. And I kept thinking like, he's got to be like, fuck, he, you know, I, I just worked with the, the king for all these years. And now I'm just doing this show. It was a, it was a cool idea and stuff, but still, I'd never done a show and he'd just come off a giant show. And I think about that for each one of you guys on the crew. What do you do next? Because that was the top top of the world, you know? Well, I mean, there'll never be another experience like that. Right. There's no question. Um, it was so magical. I mean, I think even if Tony were starting now, we couldn't kind of have done it the way we did it. I mean, there's so many countries now that we were able to go to that you kind of can't go to now. So it was a really special time and a special place. I, it's it's really difficult, Dean. Um, yeah, there's it's all so complicated. I mean, I, I've been personally really happy to see that, although it's something that's talked about, the way in which Tony died doesn't seem to have um, tarnished his legacy in too terrible a way. You know, I know for me it hasn't, although that's something I kind of struggle with, you know, and certainly I do in the book. Um, you know, how is it that when like the your hero idol, the coolest person ever who represents all these amazing things that you've worked toward, like uh, doing something adventurous and being open to new experiences and enjoying life takes their life. It's kind of a really giant mind fuck. It really is. For me, it was writing the book helped me deal with some of that. Man, it's just it's it, it's just so heavy still right now. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he was just a, a, a giant icon of cool. Do you think he knew he was cool or was one of those guys that was like constantly like, ah, shit, is this any good? What are we doing? No, he he he, he absolutely suffered from a very serious case of imposter syndrome. Um, he was always very worried about that. And the more people kind of flattered him, the more it made him feel unworthy. I don't think he knew quite how famous he was or beloved, certainly. I mean, the way he talked about it was that, you know, there were always, we're all just always one fuck up away from obscurity. And he joked that, uh, you know, one fuck up and then I'll be um, giving, uh, what is it? I'll be on the side of the West Side Highway giving hand jobs to motorists for, you know, crack. <laughs> um, but he was not believe it or not, naturally a cool person, although that's something he aspired to. I, one thing he used to say was, well, anyway, um, no, he, he, he aspired to be cool, but I think like many cool people or people in the arts and artists, um, he struggled with, um, I guess, feelings of self-worth. I mean, that was again, part of the, that magic recipe of Tony's was that he wasn't, you know, so full of himself that, I mean, he was he did kind of this, have this bravado, but I think that even if it was subconscious, part of what, you know, attracted people to him was that he, you know, wasn't a pompous asshole. Right. And he definitely was not. I think what attracted me to him was just a hundred percent how real he was. It was just like, here I am just a, a rock and roller. And uh, all of a sudden I'm in love with a chef. Like this guy's great. And it was the, a lot of it was the, it's the recipe of uh, things I love, danger, authenticity, kooky, you know, like just like there it was like what's going to happen. And those are always a recipe of something very, very cool. And, and, and you're right. Usually some heavy insecurity behind that. And uh, I could tell he was cool by his music taste. If I was at a party and we were in the corner and I didn't know who he was, and he was throwing on like Queens of the Stone Age and then Brian Jonestown Massacre into the kills. I'm like, oh, this guy is fucking cool. He uh, he gets it. To me, he was the, the coolest person ever, of course. He was a I mean, he was a real nerd, actually. And I, but I guess that maybe I have an outdated version of what it is to be uh, cool. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, at least when we started uh, Cook's tour, it was like the leather jacket, the thumb ring, you know, and the, the earring. You know, that was that was sort of like uh, cool in that way. But I mean, now nerds are cool. I think that he was um, 
I mean, with his sort of food tweeting that he'd do also, he could you kind of walk in any world. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because it's like people call it nerds. I don't think it's nerds because when I grew up, nerds were like they were didn't talk. They couldn't talk. They, you know, the classic with the, mm-hmm. the pencils and, the you know, in the front yeah, pocket. No, that was that was never Tony. No, yeah. no. <laughs> but nerds, I think, is uh, that word is thrown around and really mistaken for passionate. And, you know, you, you got a guy who says, like, uh, I'm a food nerd. It's like, no, you know, you're passionate about food. Yeah, you're, you're not a, a nerd. Distinction. Right. A nerd is somebody that nobody, you know, that gets beat up. <laughs> you know, it, it's just like a, a, a weird person. But, you know, T- Tony was always incredibly enthusiastic about whatever it was he chose to sort of gaze at or head toward. Um, and he did it with superhuman enthusiasm and passion i love the uh the burma train story uh that was quite a ride yeah i was just picturing it like uh you know the wheels could fall off and and it's old crusty train oh my gosh well i mean you know thank god you know that's in the show so anyone i mean i feel like otherwise if i was just reading that story i wouldn't believe it because yeah. it sounds almost uh, extremely exaggerated, but you can see the show and see that it's not that train ride. It, it crept along at this snail's pace forever. Then all of a sudden, once we were out of the city and darkness had fallen, it just like hit the accelerator. The damn thing was like, felt like it was going to bounce off the tracks. And you know, there'd been um, a couple of really bad train crashes or at least eight really bad train crash quite recently there. It was on all the newspapers. So it's, it's uh, good to point out you know, the book, obviously, I deal with a lot of heavy stuff that I was sort of going through dealing with Tony's loss. But it's, I guess when I started to write it, I, I wasn't thinking as much of that would be in the book. And I don't think there is that much of it. I mean, I wanted to write a book about all of the crazy adventures and stories and experiences that we'd had like that, like real life roller coaster rides in the most amazing places and all the kind of weird hoops to jump through and tight ropes to walk along in order to uh, to get it done. Oh yeah, stuff like fixers. I love reading this kind of behind the scenes stuff, you know. You got to pay people to get stuff going on and and you got to find people that know the language and that are also can talk people into letting you film and play. There's so much well, behind it's incredibly the incredibly complex number of moving pieces and it was different for each location depending on what the country was what the subject matter was that Tony wanted to film and, you know, who it was we were working with, you know, like our trip to Iran that literally took an act of Congress to get us to go there because we had to be able to quote, import and quote our film gear and computers into the country, which violated trade sanctions. So yeah, that that took years and an act of Congress to get there. Libya, the visas were so hard there. A lot of these countries had a film commission that would sort of follow you, follow us. And, um, or even be with us, depending on the country. And they are responsible for controlling what it is that, you know, we're supposed to film. And that was always an interesting line to walk because it didn't even matter if there was a way to kind of tell the story in spite of these government minders, whatever it was they were trying to censor, because ultimately we left and the people that stayed behind were going to have to deal with that show, whatever it was that we said. So all of a sudden, you know, when we started to go to these kind of more intense places, Um, and later no reservations. And then in CNN, it was um, a whole new set of things to kind of add to the list to figure out. That's insane, man. I mean, I I can't even imagine what it's like. Like He comes in, all right, I want to go to Iran, get it done. (laughs) And then you're like, two years goes by. I thought we were going to go to Iran. Yeah, we're still working on getting the cameras in. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like yeah, what? Well, no, I mean, it would be more like that scenario, except that Tony would have been asking uh, like every Monday wow. until oh, for that two year period. He, you know, when he was fixated on something, it didn't go away for two years and then come back. I mean, that sort of thing could happen, but um, no, he was uh, like a puppy with a rag doll. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let things go. <laughs> well, congrats on the book, man. And uh, I wish you, uh, peace of mind my friend i i Thank know you, it's Dan. i know it's it's i know i know what you're going through and and it's 
you know, reading the part like right when Anthony's gone, this employee comes in and goes, yeah, my father killed himself. And you just, it doesn't matter what somebody else says to you. It's what you're dealing with. And also, it, you know, like me, I'm at the comedy store every night. I'm constantly reminded by my friend. And then I guess eventually I figure out how to turn it around and celebrate his, uh, his, you know, his spirit when I'm there, but it is, uh, unfortunately it's a fucking horrible part of life. Uh, yeah. And well, you know, T Tony would always say, um, one of his popular sayings was, yeah, uh, if you can't laugh, there's nothing left to do, but cry. And we were always laughing. Uh, even when we were in these really stressful situations while making the shows, he was so funny. Even when shit was going wrong, he was so funny. And I hope I captured that part in the book. Um, and, you know, for a long time after he died, I couldn't laugh or cry. You know, I can again now. And um, that's great. And I hope that, although I didn't intend it in any way when I had to write the book, if in any way it helps anyone else deal with that kind of shit that doesn't make sense tony being gone then that's kind of great yeah absolutely beautiful book man in the weeds thank you dean and uh so great to talk to you i hope to meet you one day i'd and, love that yeah i come out to new york we'll get some uh lunch and uh laugh come see some comedy and laugh you know i would love that that'd be great man and if you're in la whatever hit me anytime and uh, please do. stay in touch. It's called In the Weeds. It's out. And is the uh, is the audio book out? The version yeah, of that? It, it is. It came out at the same time, you know, which is recorded by me. So you get to hear my fun voice for however many hours that is. That's great. I love the cover of this. Who did the cover? It's beautiful. I, the, one of the graphic designers at Hachette did the God, cover. It's, it's I, nice, I, man. I, I'd wanted... Um, you know, we made these travel guides for the layover that I worked on and we had to uh, fake book titles over the years. Oh yeah. We always did a kind of Graham green esque uh, book cover, you know, the sort of mid century kind of things. Um, Tony liked those. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for uh, doing the podcast. Pleasure and, talking to you, Dean. Yeah. And uh, stay, say, stay healthy, my man. You too. Take care. Thanks so much for having me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Get my info and uh, text me, man. Will do. All right, bro. Awesome. See ya. Thanks, Dean. Bye. Later, man. Later.